Let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy this morning in our journey through the Bible. And we're clicking these books off now. We're almost at the end of Scripture. But today we come to this second letter to young Timothy. The books of First and Second Timothy, by the way, were written by who? The Apostle Paul. And uh, the date, 63 A.D. and 66 A.D. respectively. The purpose, along with Paul's letter to Titus, 1 and 2 Timothy are known as the pastoral letters or the pastoral epistles. And this was written to Timothy and Titus to address uh, issues in the churches where they were serving at Crete and Ephesus. This letter covers topics uh, such as, well, both the letters really, covers topics such as the qualifications and duties of pastors and deacons. It talks about the inspiration of Scripture, that all Scripture is God-breathed. And it speaks of the treatment of widows and the expectation of uh, God's rewards for obedience. And today, in this uh, second letter, 2 Timothy is written from Paul's last imprisonment. So, if you look at chapter 4, verse 7, notice what it says there. Chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And in verse 8, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I'm trying to get my coat off, but I'm wrapped up in this microphone. So let me figure this out. Here we go. Am I still on? I think I cut it off. Now, how are we now? Got it? Okay, good. So, in this letter, uh, Paul was arrested, and he went back to Rome, and this time he is in prison as a criminal. In the first letter, he was arrested, and he was in Rome under house arrest, and that meant that people could come and see him, and he could have visitors and teach God's Word, but this time he could have no visitors. This time he was in a dungeon. This time he was arrested unexpectedly and they jailed him so fast that he did not have time to get his books. He talks about his parchments. He didn't have time to get his coat and it was going to get winter and he needed his coat. And so 2 Timothy 4.13 he talks about uh, to Timothy telling him to bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come in the books, especially the parchments. So it's a lot different for Paul this time. and He expected his case to be heard sometime that winter by Nero. And he'd actually gone before Nero, and Nero postponed the judgment uh, on the case. And Paul, there's a little bit of ring I hear up here. And he postponed uh, the judgment. So Paul knew that he was going to die. He knew this was it. He was put in prison. He was in a dungeon. He penned this letter, which was his very last letter. After this, he didn't write anything else because this was the end of his life. And so these words are his last words. And he writes these words to his young preacher boy, Timothy. And it's well to remember this last writing. It's a very personal letter. In fact, he mentions 23 individual people in this letter, this particular letter. So it's very personal. But the thing that strikes me is here is Paul in a dungeon alone and he's thinking of the people that he mentions in this letter. He's thinking of the church. He's thinking of his relationship with Jesus. He's not thinking about his situation. That tells you the kind of person that Paul was. He was so committed to Christ that even in the midst of of great persecution. His thoughts are on Jesus and his thoughts are on others. So we can see why he was so greatly used of the Lord. 
and why he was such a, a wonderful person. Now, in these chapters, there are themes, and so we're going to look at the different themes that we find, one theme in each chapter. And in chapter 1, we see a worshipful home. A worshipful home. And the gist of this chapter teaches us that the example of parents today in the home is the greatest answer to juvenile delinquency. And it can also be the greatest problem. So he reminds us in this chapter that young people ought to have a very strong Christian influence in their life, and it begins at home. That's so important. And as you read through this, this first chapter, he talks about Eunice and, and Lois towards the end of the book, I think it is, and the importance of their relationship with young Timothy. So he, he starts out here with the, the need for this kind of home life. And I read this and I thought, too many parents today are missing out on this. Uh, too many parents are missing from the church. Too many parents uh, are missing out on the family altar. I could tell when I mentioned that Sunday morning because when you preach, you can kind of read people's faces. You get used to doing that, especially when you've been doing it a long time. And I could tell Sunday morning when I talked about the importance of a family altar that there was conviction on the faces of a lot of people who don't have a family altar. And that's, that's even in the church. So he's teaching Timothy here the importance of that of getting it right when children are toddlers. That's important. You have to get them when they're toddlers. And you have to set a, a godly example for them. And never quit praying for them. I had somebody tell me a week or two ago about a situation that they were praying about and they were uh, really, uh, I guess their heart was hurting over that situation. And it was a home situation. And they said, I don't know what else to do. I've prayed all I know to pray. And I always say this, and I've said it probably a thousand times. Remember, your children cannot outrun your prayers. Amen. They can't. And I've seen children uh, see their parents die and come to Jesus through that or after that. And I knew in my heart that their parents had been praying for that all, all, all through their life. And it was finally answered, even after they were in heaven. So, your children can't outrun your prayers. Don't quit praying. Don't give up. Just keep on praying. Keep on asking God, because God, God's timing may be different from our timing, and we can't understand all those things, but we don't give up. And that's what Paul is talking about here, that that we keep praying. If you look at verse 2 uh, of chapter 1, you see there that he says, to Timothy, a beloved son. Circle that word beloved. It means true. A true son. Now he's talking, of course, about a spiritual sonship. That Paul considered Timothy to be his son in the ministry. That he took him under his wing and he taught him everything that he knew and he prayed for him and he helped him along and they talked over things a lot. And so Paul had invested his life in young Timothy. And by this time, here in this letter, Timothy's about 35 years old. He's very timid and he pastors the church at Ephesus and it's a difficult church for him. And so Paul is teaching him. And Paul is helping him to, to understand. And he, he's talking here about the importance of sound teaching. <coughs> I want you to go to back to 1 Timothy and look at chapter 6, verse 11. Look at what Paul says to young Timothy. He says, but you, O man of God, circle that phrase, O man of God, and he says, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. But it's not, we notice that he calls 
him a, a man of God. Now, what does that mean? How is a person godly? Godliness comes from two things. Godliness comes from the Word of God, and godliness comes from prayer. A, he calls him a, a godly man. When we read the Bible, God speaks to us. When we pray, we speak to God. And you can never be godly without prayer and the Word of God. Do you understand? Of course, I'm not, I'm not talking about salvation. We know that Christ makes us godly in salvation. But in our spiritual journey, in our daily walk, we read the Word of God and God speaks to us. And we pray and we speak to God. So he talks about sound teaching and growing in Christ. And he talks to Timothy here about developing his gift, his spiritual gift or gifts. And he, he tells him not to neglect his gift. I want you to turn over to chapter 4 for a minute. Look at verse 14. That's in 1 Timothy, now not 2nd. We're going back to come to Look at what he says. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. <clears throat> Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So he's talking about the gifts the Spirit of God has given him. And he's saying that He's saying to Timothy, you need to make sure you cultivate these gifts, you use these gifts, and as you use them, they will get stronger, and God will use them more and more in your life to bring others to Christ and to help them grow in Christ. It's a little bit like a story I read about two men who had been discussing the possibility of how to keep weeds out of the garden permanently. Now, if, if you know how to do that, let's talk after service today. And uh, we're going we're gonna to get famous. You're going to get famous real quick because I'm going to make some phone calls and tell them you know how to keep weeds out of a garden permanent. Farmers are going to love you. But this one man said, well, I think you can just burn, burn the weeds out. And he said, if you just burn the weeds out of the garden, uh, there won't be any weeds. And, and the other guy said, well, said, I don't, I don't think that will work because weeds will grow back. And so they were in kind of an argument about it, and this third guy was listening to their conversation, and, and he said to both of them, he said, look, y'all are friends, and you're talking about how to keep weeds out of your garden, and there's not but one way you can do that. You have to burn it permanently. You have to burn it all the time. You have to let it burn all the time to keep the weeds out of the garden. Well, of course, if you burn it all the time, you can't have a garden. But this is really the point that Paul is making with Timothy when he talks to him about these spiritual gifts. He's saying if you don't cultivate them, and Paul said to him, you stir them up. You, you, you have a passion about your gifts and you stir them up. And you don't just stir them up one time. You stir them up every day, all the time. You keep them stirred up. And isn't it true that sometimes as we get older, we tend to lose the passion that we once had in serving Christ. And Paul warned Timothy about that. He said, you stir up in you this gift that God has given you. And I think about all of you and the spiritual gifts that God has given to you. And I, I think you do try to stir them up. I, I really do. I think you try to keep that passion and that fire going. And I commend you for that. But that's important as we age to, to keep that passion, that fire burning, to develop our, our spiritual gift. Then go to chapter 2, and this is back in 2 Timothy now. And here he talks about a, a good soldier. A good soldier. Look at verse 2 of chapter 2. And he says, And the things 
that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And then verse 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier does not spend his time thinking about uh, trivial things. The only thing a soldier has to do is obey his superior. I mean, a private in the army is not going to think about strategy. That's the general's job. But when the general gives the command and it comes down the line, then the private is going to do what he's told. He's going to go to the front line and he's going to fight. He's going to have to endure hardship. And so Paul is teaching Timothy that it's like that for those of us who are believers. That we have to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul was a good man, but Paul endured the most cruel persecution other than Jesus that a human being could endure. I mean, you read about what he said in his letters and how he said that he had been beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and uh, all of these things that happened to him. And it, it was all because he loved Jesus and he, he served Jesus. And everywhere Paul went, he either had a revival or a riot. And most of the time it was a riot and he was run out of town and then they had a revival. So he understood about hardship and persecution and he sees Timothy and he sees Timothy's heart and he sees Timothy's spirit, his quiet spirit, and he knows it's going to be tough for him. And he says, you endure hardship as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Paul was speaking these words in love to Timothy. And then if you go on down chapter 2, verse 24. <clears throat> And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. He's telling Timothy again that there will be times when it is necessary to exercise godly discipline because he knows that will be hard for Timothy. Then move with me to chapter 3. And in chapter 3 he talks about a godly life. When the battle is on and the faith is assailed, he says, stand firm, stand strong. And then he tells him how to do it here in this third chapter. And he talks about how society is going to be. If you look at chapter 3, verse 5, it says, they will have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And Paul warned him about the, the wolves in sheep's clothing that would creep in and if you read the book of Acts, by this time they were already creeping in the church. But we see something here that, that we need to remember. There's only one way to be strengthened against all the voices that tempt us today. Only one way. And the Bible tells us what that is. Have you ever heard anyone say, I was a drunk, I was a disgrace to my family, I was a disgrace to the world, and then I read the multiplication table, and it changed my life. You ever heard anybody say that? I have not. Three times four just did it for me. I've never heard anybody say that. Have you ever heard anybody say that and say, then I learned science, and science changed my life. Now, science is a good thing, and science can, can uh, teach us things, but only Jesus Christ can change our life. Only Jesus. And Jesus is the Word. And so Paul is saying to Timothy here that you need to remember when you're tempted that the only way you're going to overcome temptation is the same way Jesus overcame temptation. How did He do it? By what? And the Word of God. You remember? He spoke the Word of God when the devil tempted Him. What did the devil do? He spoke the Word of God back to the Son of God, but he twisted it a little bit. That's what the devil always does. The most dangerous kind of truth or the most dangerous kind of lie is a lie that has truth in it. And that's what the devil did. The devil would give you back Scripture 
but he'll twist it. Didn't he do that to Adam and Eve? Sure he did. He did it to them. He did it to Jesus. He's going to do it to you and me. So that's why we need to know the Word of God. That's why Scripture says it is a lamp and a light. And we hide it in our heart that we might not sin against God. So God's Word is important in overcoming temptation. And Paul wanted young Timothy to know that. Even down to this day, the only thing that will keep a church alive in this day is the Word of God. That's it. When everything else is gone, the Word of God will endure. Does the Bible not say that? Everything's going to pass away, but the Word of God will not pass away. And that's why everything must be built on the Word of God. And Jesus is the living Word. Jesus talked about that in the Gospel of John. So it's the only thing that will keep the church alive in the terrible day that Paul lived and in the day that we live. Then chapter 4, we see Paul's farewell. Paul's farewell. Life's last hours for Paul were full of glory. He forgot about the lions that were in the arena. He forgot about being uh, set on fire at the stake. He forgot that he might be nailed to a cross. And by the way, he didn't die any of those ways. They beheaded him. And he was thinking only about the memories of his walk with Jesus that gave him peace. Now that's the way to die. The way to die is to die not looking on back on life with regret, but looking forward to eternal life with our mind set on Jesus. I've seen people die that way, and I know some of you have too. And it's a beautiful thing to see a person die focused on Jesus. And so he's, he's saying to Timothy his farewell in this last chapter, his farewell between he and Timothy and his other friends and here he gives the best advice to this young preacher boy that can ever be given and I want you to look at chapter 4 verse 2 and verse 3 he says preach the word be ready in season and out of season you know what that means be ready all the time convince rebuke exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's his last charge. To Timothy. That's his farewell speech. I have in my mind's eye a picture of this old battle-scarred hero, Paul, standing in a gloomy dungeon, down dungeon, in chains. And usually in those dungeons there was one little window, just a, a little slit of a window in the roof. And I can see Paul standing there in those chains looking up through that little window. And he could see that light that entered and it revealed, I believe, on him a countenance of perfect peace. His lips were moving. If you listen, you can hear him say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who long for his appearing. The crown of 
crown of righteousness. Paul will receive that. We can too. So these last verses give us a, a very tender glimpse of this great warrior for Christ. This great runner. I love what he says here in 2 Timothy 4, 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me that, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. He put his pen down for the last time. They took him out and laid his head in a chopping block. And, and when they executed somebody that way in Rome in that day, your head was facing up, not down. You were looking up. The reason they did that is they, they wanted to be as cruel as they could, and they wanted the people they executed to see the, the axe blade fall. And there he is. And he's on the chopping block, and he's looking up into heaven. And I've always wondered what it must have been like for that man who swung the axe. Because he'd done that many times before. And he probably saw people die screaming and crying and hollering and closing their eyes. But for Paul, his eyes wide open because Paul was not looking at that execution. Paul was not looking at that axe blade. Paul was looking at Jesus. And the axe blade failed. And in the next second, he was forever with Jesus. We're going to see him one day. Jesus and Paul. We're going to see Paul. And I want to ask him. Maybe we'll just get this group together one day and say, Paul, tell us how that was when that axe blade failed. And, and hear him tell us that story. But his, just like Stephen, when Stephen was killed, what did he see? He saw Jesus, and he saw Jesus standing, it says. Now, when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible says he sat beside the right hand of God the Father. But when Stephen, who was the first martyr of our faith, when he was killed, he said, I see Jesus standing. In other words, Jesus was watching him. Jesus knew what was going on with him. And when they killed Stephen, Jesus stood up greeting as he came into glory. One of these days, Jesus is going to greet us. I don't know if any of us will be called upon to give our lives for the faith. But I know this, as the world goes on and things get worse, and if we read Scripture, it says it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And if Jesus does not come back, the day may well come when some in this nation will be martyrs for their faith. Did you know there are more people martyred for Christ now in the world than ever before? Mm -hmm. More today than back when Paul lived. There are more people. There are more of them being killed for Jesus than ever before. So take heart. This is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of eternity. And that all gets you excited. Uh, did you watch on TV when the embassy opened? Anybody watch that? Yes. In Jerusalem? Yes. I'll tell you one thing. We're getting close. You know, when that when that happened, it's just getting us closer and closer to the day the Lord comes back. And there's an old prophecy in Daniel that says, when they say peace and safety then you look up I was thinking the other day if old Netanyahu had gotten up I was hoping he was going to say and now it is peace and safety and we go <laughs> and he could have easily said that 
And that speech may already be written. I don't know. But there has never been a time in the history of the world like today. And so we need to be ready. And we need to be excited. Sometimes when Tanya and I go to bed at night, we'll say, well, I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you in heaven. We'll get raptured. It'll be fun going up together. <laughs> and I, it, it's coming, folks. It's coming. It's going to happen. And that's our hope. And that's our joy as children of God.